Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming, both to the people in the Zoom and people in the room. Um, welcome to Creative Mornings. I'd like to first uh, show our gratitude for being on the unceded and traditional territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Musaynish nations. Um, welcome to the Victoria Arts Council. Creative Mornings is a global organization, so the way that it happens is every month, one of the chapters picks a theme. And then uh, we bring a speaker that we think could speak to that theme. It doesn't always work, but sometimes matches. Um, so our February theme is native and it was picked by the Honolulu chapter. Mm -hmm. And this illustration was illustrated by Jack Soren. And this is the write-up they had for it. <laughs> Where you are from shapes who you are. Where you call home influences your worldview. Understanding the traditions of your ancestors can help answer the question, where do I belong? Your connections to a place and the past should rightfully be a source of great pride. The unique customs, art, and languages of native cultures make the tapestry of human civilization more vibrant. Yet many indigenous communities have faced marginalization, land dispossession, and cultural erasure. How much have we lost and what can be preserved? By respecting and celebrating the traditions and achievements of native people everywhere, we can discover a deeper sense of connection and unity. What does our history have to teach us? What can we learn from each other? After that, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the city of Victoria and the CRD, as well as HCMA, which is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. Um, and we are in the Victoria Arts Council, which in February, as you can see around you, we have the show You Are Welcome. It includes 10 artists from diverse international backgrounds who are new to calling Victoria home. So the pieces kind of recall the artist's homelands through the lens of Vancouver Island. And this is a project we're doing in collaboration with the Intercultural Association of Victoria. Um, so we're open Wednesday to Sunday, 12 to 5. It's on until March 3rd, so this is kind of the last week to see it. Um, and we also have a number of satellite showcases around town, including the public libraries and International Airport, um, where we show our members' work. You can see on our website more about these also. And without uh, further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Sarah Jim, a visual artist of mixed ancestry, and a proud member of Wasanich Nation from the Sycombe Village. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Victoria and practices environmental restoration on her ancestral territory with the Hippokin. I should have asked you this. Can you help me okay. read it? Heyo. Heyo. Foundation and Sycombe IV project. Creating place-based artwork of her homelands and waters allows her to explore the importance of native plant food systems coastal medicines, and traditional practices in relation to the ecosystem and Wasainish culture. Her creations reflect and advocate for the beautiful land, sea, and skies that the Wasainish have stewarded since time immemorial. For more info, you can also go to Um let's, let's give a welcome to Sarah. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> um. Thanks, <laughs> Rachel Hala. Uh, Sarah Jim Fena Snape, Chisalayat Snape, Sanich E. Psychum, Sequimpton Fena Main, Wendy Fena Tain, Elixin Quince Tachelson. Um, so I just said, Insan Chopin. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Jim. I'm from uh, Psychum, from the from Sanich. On my dad's side, I introduced my parents. Um, my dad's name is Sequimpton. His English name is David Jim. We're also of Coast, like Coast Salish and Mexican ancestry. And my mom's name is Wendy. We're English and Russian Jewish. So I have a mixed background, but I grew up in Sycom my whole life and I'm currently living there as well. And yeah, just hearing your introduction of like what native is and like a lot of that responsibility is for me, like stewarding my homelands. And like, I didn't grow up with a super rich cultural background. Like I grew up on the res, but didn't really have culture to ground me or like to identify with. And so um, 
I'm learning all this as an adult. And so I, I started the Psychum Ivy project three years ago now, which is like crazy, but I'm, I'm really happy with the progress we're making and uh, inviting volunteers in to work alongside each other for a collective common goal is, is really powerful. Like pulling Ivy is a really simple act, but doing it together as a collective and having the same vision and just being in the forest and getting dirty and being friends with like the worms and the frogs and everything is like really beautiful. Um, we had our first Ivy pull of the year two days ago with um, Lee Joseph from Squamish. She has swollen botanicals. She she teaches a class at UVic for a week during reading break. And this class is really land-based. And so she's been coming to my project for the last couple of years and building that relationship with that place. And so I was feeling like kind of nervous about it because it was the first poll of the year. And I was like, I I often facilitate circles and things. And so I have to public speak. And I was really nervous and just being on the land and in the bush and with the dirt and the frogs and everything, like my soul needed that a lot. And so I was really grateful that I can facilitate these opportunities. But um, so the history of the Psychomivy Project is my my family, the Jim family in Sycam, is responsible for stewarding 18 acres of forest in Sycam. And this is quite a substantial area on the reserve because the whole reserve itself is like 62 acres, I think. It's quite small. I think we have about 200 members. And so it's the smallest on the peninsula. And so the majority of the reserve has been developed for housing, which is important because people need places to live. And so I find this last bit of remaining forest really significant because it's kind of one of the last in, in the area. And so it's over the last couple of years, like as I've been learning about plants and native plants and invasive species, I've really had the lens of looking at this bit of forest and being like, this place needs help. And so as I spend more time in there, I was really feeling like there's ivy absolutely everywhere. It's like it's climbing up the trees and it's like strangling them and it's taking over the forest floor. And this is really problematic because it's detrimental to biodiversity. So invasive species are problematic because they create a monoculture. And when there's just one thing, the land is really susceptible to climate change and um, all the creatures in the forest like lose their access to their foods and medicines and same with people as well. Like we don't see like salmon berries growing or thimble berries growing, like all of our traditional foods and medicines are being smothered by these invasive plants. Um, and so once I started noticing this uh, with the with this new lens I had of the of the plants, I wanted to take action. And so <laughs> me and my partner and my family started like chopping the ivy off the trees and there's like hundreds of trees in this forest. And so it was like a really insurmountable task it felt like we were macheting and like our arms were so sore. And I was like, I think we're gonna need some help. And so over the last six years, as I've been working with Opaik and Hayout, which is um, another Sinchotham word, it means blossoming place. And we're a not-for-profit organization based at the tribal school in Brentwood. And we facilitate land-based learning opportunities and education. With the nursery at the tribal school, we have programs for the, the students there. So we teach them how to garden and, and about native plants and like how to be a little steward essentially. Mm -hmm. And then um, my role is more doing restoration around the territory. And so for the past six years, that's the plant knowledge and like the expertise that I've gained just as, like by working in community. And so um, over the over this course of this time, uh, working with the Pekin Hayout, I've started building connections and networking with volunteers and people who want to help. Mm -hmm. And so I started inviting these friends into Psychum to pull the ivy. And um, yeah, it's grown a lot since then. And you know, we've we've had feasts on the land, as you can see with these photos. And it's just like it's really celebratory. It's not like like we're working super hard, we have to get this done. It's more like very casual and everyone's like chatting and laughing and just like really um, utilizing the healing power of like being on the land and helping the land. Um, I often, I actually don't often do talks like this because I 
typically when people ask me about plants, I invite them to do restoration alongside me. Um, but I thought this was a good opportunity to just like tell the story of, of how this came to be. Um, yeah, and it's been it's been three years and we've made a really massive dent. Like we started working by taking the ivy off of the trees. So you cut around the tree from like the diameter of the tree and, and the ivy all up dies mm -hmm. because it lost its resources from the ground. And um, you start by doing this because for one, it it saves the weight of all the ivy growing up on the tree and like taking the trees down because um, ivy grows up towards the light. And once once it starts growing vertically, mm -hmm. that's when it starts to flower and fruit. And that's when birds start to eat the fruit and spread it. And so when it's growing up, that's when the seeds spread. So we started with all the trees. We got a majority of them, I would say. And so we've been working on the ground. And this is like ivy is probably the most satisfying invasive to take out because like you can just start in one little spot and just move and it it clears the space and you can like meet up with people who are working towards you. And it, it's it's kind of like untangling like a necklace or like phone cords if you like doing that. I, I like that kind of tedious stuff. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we take all the ivy out of the forest and we pile it up and we've got like literal tons of ivy that we've got taken away. Um, and every spring, new native plants come up, which is really exciting. So essentially, like when you clear the space for the natives to grow, they're, they've just been in the seed bank waiting to, for their opportunity. And this is like quite symbolic and metaphorical of just, you know, opportunities for indigenous species and plants and people to thrive again. Um, but the thing with restoration is like, you can't just clear a space and it's done forever. You, you have to constantly go back and continually build a relationship with these places. It's not like uh, landscaping at all where you install it and then you're done. It's, it's essentially like a continuation of the stewardship that's been happening here for millennia, but with a different context because there's invasive plants now. And so, yeah, I, I joke about like, I hope the ivy's never gone because I love when people come over and come in and I feel like we always open with an intro circle so everyone introduces themselves and where they're from. And then we always end with like a closing circle and everyone's invited to share their like reflections and ideas or how they're feeling. And I feel like that's a really beautiful way to bring people into it rather than me being like, a talking head at the front of the room like I love the participatory aspect of that and it just feels like good to end the day in that way um and yeah we right now I'm we're hosting it at my parents place which they're very graciously open up their house for me and there's my dad on his his tractor and a, a huge pile of ivy um so yeah I've had really beautiful interactions with with people who come um volunteer and you know, I'm always just like full of gratitude how people generously like donate their time and energy and they come with good intentions and like often people, the same people will come back, which is really beautiful because I just mentioned like that relationship building is really key. Um, so yeah, right now it's it's pretty early, I guess late, late winter, early spring. There's like little stinging nettles coming up and there's elderberry starting to pop. Yeah, it's just, it excites me because I know that the land will eventually like start remembering who it is. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy about being able to facilitate this work for my family too, to have access to, their, to the foods and medicines again. And I think I'm one of the only people in my family who has like plant knowledge. And so I want this place to be like a learning opportunity for me to like do plant walks for my family and yeah and there's the ivy on the trees right there it's super gnarly like sometimes they're a huge like massive and they have like hairs growing out of them and it's like real jumanji looking <laughs> yeah there's some volunteers and friends and i don't know how long it's been i've been talking but um yeah that's uh i mean it's been 17 minutes. Okay. It's pretty good. <laughs> More minutes. Um, sorry to ask you, because I know you said it, but how long did you say you've been doing this? Six years? Like, 
Um, I've been working on the land with Papake and Hale for six years. Yeah. And then I started this project three years ago. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the goal of Papake and Hale's work is to kind of like foster um, future land stewards, mm -hmm. which I, when I first got this job with Papake and Hale, I knew nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. Like I saw green, you know, like mm -hmm. I liked nature, but I didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I was like on Evic at the time. And I was working at this pub and I was like the worst waitress ever. And my availability was terrible. And I would refuse to work on the weekends because I was me time. Mm. And then I just hated doing that. And then I, I was going to quit and they fired me, which was good because it was like, it opened this opportunity to work at the Bacon Hale. Like my sister was working at the tribal school at the time, teaching St. Chauvin. And I was talking to her as sisters do, they then was just like, I just don't want to work in a pub. Like, I don't want to just it's meaningless to me and hmm. I don't like it and I want to work outside and do something meaningful and hmm. my sister Jack was like oh there's a lady who works at the tribal school at this nursery her name's Judith and she does that work and like I'll connect you to hmm. and so falling into the uh, career of native plants and medicines and like public speaking and things was like a total fluke because hmm. I started working outside and I was like oh this is cool you just like dig up stuff all the hmm. time but it was way more than that. Like it's, like I said, like really symbolic and metaphorical and like physically decolonizing and it's like a land back thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was an interesting way to get there, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. um, because now, yeah, like I said, we have the responsibility of stewarding this 18 acres in Sycom and like, I'm glad I, I have that, that role now. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you yeah. so much. That was yeah. great. Um, I have my own question, but then I'll also open it to both rooms to ask if anything uh, comes up. But uh, knowing that you also do a lot of projects like in art and like public art, I'm curious how the two feed each other or mm -hmm. if they relate to each other in any way. Yeah, yeah, that's a good good question because I, when I was at Evic, I um, I wasn't making like Coast Salish art at all. Like I wasn't mm -hmm. taught it, and it was a very like white school, and I like I'm pretty white passing, and so I didn't want to make Coast Salish art to be critiqued by mm -hmm. white students, and it was just like a weird mm -hmm. dynamic, and so. I didn't do that. And then once I started working on the land and being in community more, I was like, you know what? I'm going to like try making Coast Salish art, like the traditional indigenous practice. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, I made this like painting on this wooden round of the native plants with like Coast Salish elements within it. Mm -hmm. And I remember my like presenting it. My teacher was like, this, yeah. "This is the best thing you've made all year." And okay. I'm like, "God damn it! I should have done this." <laughs> but that was like a turning point because I was like, "Oh, like plants are something that I'm I'm beginning to love, and then I could form it like um, adorn them with this Coast Salish tradition that I'm starting to learn about as well." And so it was like a turning point for me where I just started painting plants because I like them, and that's what I've always done. It's just like make art that you like mm -hmm. and then but I didn't realize it would have this uh, effect of people being really interested in plants after that and like noticing them and that there was like a need for native plant art especially mm -hmm. in like a Coast Salish context mm -hmm. and so I started doing a lot more and um, essentially I make it now because it's an excuse for me to talk about restoration and to talk about the cultural context of them and like why they're important and it's, I felt like I was kind of filling a gap of, 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 um, because of, in a lot of like Coast Salish art, there's the charismatic megafauna that are represented, like the wolf and the bear and the orca. And these are really important characters, like not characters, but like symbols and uh, beings in, in the art because they have a lot to teach us. But I felt like the plants were underrepresented, but there's such a huge aspect of, sure. of life here. Like, anywhere you go anywhere the way to know, understand a culture is to look at their landscape and to look at their food and that's essentially what the plants are mm -hmm. and so yeah I make plant art now just to talk about restoration and <laughs> I, it's it's a it's a good um like what's like talking point like 
yeah, I'm showing all these these art pieces of plants in a gallery, but now I'm going to talk to you about restoration that I have your attention, which is like what I care about the most. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a little chat text here. Uh, Spotting Sarah Jim murals around town makes me so happy. As someone who has volunteered on Sea Garden restoration projects, I really love the Sea Garden mural under the Johnson Bridge. This is from Tina. Thank um, you. <laughs> and okay, if sure. Yeah, there's. It's kind of accumulating now. Um, yeah, underneath the Johnson Street Bridge, there's like a 60 foot mural um, at the community fridge in Rock Bay. I painted that. Um, there's a basketball court behind the Native Friendship Center that I painted. I'm currently painting a mural with another artist, Caitlin McDonough at the new supply reuse art shop mm -hmm. right beside the old spaghetti factory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I painted the tribal school. I painted like Sneedquith, which is where I mostly do restoration. It's Sneedquith is the Sinchoffin name. It's taught in Latin English, right beside Butch Arts. Um, yeah, I put everything on my website, Sarah Jim Studio and social media and all that. But yeah, I I really value doing murals because it is like it it really kind of belongs to the public after. Like I was pretty critical of like the UVic art program just because it was pretty pretentious and like art belonged in a cube and uh, like a white cube and art is like much more accessible and also just coast like a Coast Salish representation out on the land is really important especially if like the native plants aren't present it's like I went to I went to Montreal last summer and there was like no sign of native people anywhere even though it's like there's so many murals in that city there was just like no native murals that I saw and I feel more at home when I see like indigenous art out in in public. So I'm glad I guess you contribute to that. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> um, you're mostly working with um, like removing ID as a related to these. I noticed, I know the other one just that comes is bankers. Um, like do you have plans on doing anything else for any other related species or are you sticking to ID? Yeah, it's it's like 90% ivy, but we have run into Himalayan blackberries, which we'll get to eventually. There's also some holly out in the forest, and I've seen this plant called Daphne as well. They're just not as like prevalent as the ivy is at the moment. Um, also some like creeping buttercup I've spotted, which is really hard to get rid of. So we'll see what happens when the ivy is gone, which I think will be in like 10 years. <laughs> We'll, we'll see. I don't know. I This is like, um, I've never seen a restoration project at the very beginning. Like when I started in Sneedquith, it was kind of already, I think, eight years along. And so it's kind of managed already. But this one is totally from scratch, like right at the beginning. So I'm really interested to see how it plays out. Is the item preserved or are there any other ways to use it after this point? Yeah, um, people can be creative with it. Like I was talking to an artist yesterday who burned it to make charcoal and to make drawings and stuff. You'd have to make a lot of drawings with the <laughs> ivy we're, <laughs> we're taking out. Um, some people just roll it up and keep it on in a pile to decompose. That kind of scares me because I've heard that ivy can reroot itself and start growing again. Um, most people take it to the landfill, which isn't a great thing either. Um, some people bring it to these remediation sites, which are essentially big blasted pits where they just dump ivy and in invasive into, which is like not a good thing to do because it can just reroute and spread. So there's no standardization of like what to do. What I do is I take, I got a grant from the CRD to divert things from the landfill and what we've kind of figured out to do is take it to this mill in Imo and they burn it for biofuel. So after the pile gets huge, I just get a big truck to take it away. And that's what they do for now, which isn't perfect because emissions and whatnot, but 
yeah, we, we definitely need standardizations for, for invasive plants because everybody has that question, like, what do I do with it now? And just dumping it in the landfill doesn't seem right, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I've heard some people use it for like washing detergent. So, and like some people weave with it, like baskets and things. So mm -hmm. you can get creative, but I just am dealing with such a giant amount that I have to just kind of get rid of it. Um, I have a, we have a text from Lucas Glenn. Hi, Sarah Jen. Do you consider your art on your rest or your restoration to be activist work? Or is that a label you'd like to avoid? Your fan in perpetuity, Lucas Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lucas. Um, activist. I don't know. I've, I've been labeled that in the past but I feel like just as indigenous people we are naturally just advocating for the land I think in the context of it being under attack it might look like an activist activism act mm -hmm. um yeah I don't really care what people call me but I just I just know that what I'm doing on the land and with my art is it feels right and it feels like the path that I'm meant to be on and um it's a good question <laughs> thank you cool um is that it or, or just wondering if you have um interest in other sites or have you been to other forests in the area to look at like what kind of invasive species might be happening in that area do you see a lot of difference between um, I can't go anywhere without being overwhelmed by all the invasive plants. Uh, it's it's a it's really problematic, and I've talked to some people who are who don't even, like they just see green. Like I said, I had before and. So I feel like education is a really important aspect of, of knowing the landscape and knowing that like, oh, this ivy is so pretty. It's like, no, it's actually really, really problematic because it is everywhere. Um, there's a farm up the road, Sandown, and they, they have a forest that kind of connects to mine. And they they have a huge ivy problem as well. So I told them, I was like, well, once I'm done mine, like I'll come work with you. But it's, it's, it's really problematic. Um, because everywhere you go, like invasives are everywhere. Um, but yeah, right now I'm focusing my efforts in psycho, and then I think I will branch out and like help sand down. And um, something that's really inspiring is I've talked to, I think friends of Dean Park. They're like a volunteer group. They uh, started removing the ivy on Fleilna or Mount Newton like ten years ago. And it's been eradicated. Like it doesn't, there's none there now just because with the efforts of volunteers. And so that's really inspiring for me because that's a really big mm -hmm. landscape. Like that's a really big area. So it is possible. And I do have dreams of like restoring the world. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, it's, it's just in my capacity as a witness walking through this park and where I used to live for such a small place there. Mm -hmm. um, over about maybe five or six years, it actually came down to six foot feet. There were volunteers um, getting rid of invasive species in an area that was eventually kind of just like uh, a bit roped off so that they could work. And over the years, just this astounding atmosphere reappeared. Like, mm -hmm. like incredibly, you know. It, Shocking to see from one year to the next. Yeah, the land is really resilient. It just needs that um, human intervention, like it always has. I know that when settlers first came here, they were like, oh, look at this beautiful, untouched wilderness. Like the native people don't even know what they have. But that was a fallacy because, in like, indigenous people here and everywhere had been tending to the land for since time immemorial and what the settlers were seeing was like a intimate relationship that the people had with the place and that the place was shaping the people as well so for an example like cultural or um, prescribed burning of the camas meadows kept them healthy and abundant and this was like a very intentional thing to be doing it's and uh 
there was also yeah and digging up the camas too so camas was a food is a food source and digging it up made the like aerated the soil to make it fluffy and also gave space to the camas that they didn't dig up and so it just like contributed to the health of the fields as well and so yeah i i see that you know a lot of people think this now but like nature and people are one like they need each other to thrive and so when the settlers were like nature does what it is and we're over here like that's not right at all like the land actually needs their help yes please uh, thanks for sharing the story it was a great project um i'm curious if there's uh i'm guessing uh, some of them holes on the land but i'm wondering if there's other ways people can help support the work that you do there and Way to donate funds for the project. Uh, and I'm also curious if there's other projects like in this area that you would like to suggest that people support as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. I I do have upcoming polls. I think we're gonna do every last Friday of the month, starting in April. And I'm sorry it's on a weekday, but I don't work on the weekends like I mentioned earlier. <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah, like please come out and and like be in the bush and meet cool people. And then I this project is very low budget. Like I don't, it's totally volunteer for me. And I have this organization called Hat helping me every month. And they they bring tools and gloves and snacks and they kind of like contribute resources, which is great for me because it's nice to have that support and accountability to like get out of bed every Friday. Um but they're they're super great. But I would I would suggest um, donating to Pepe and Hale, my other uh, organization I work for. We're we're quite bigger. We have a lot more restoration sites, and we maintain the nursery, like I said. And um, yeah, so that's papakenhayout.com. Real easy to remember. But uh, mm -hmm. I on on the Psychom Ivy Project website, I do have uh, a tab that's like friends of the project, and it's a giant list of other non-for-profits and organizations that offer uh, volunteer opportunities and ways you can donate and stuff. So that's a good place to start. Yeah, because I, I, sorry, um, I recognize that like physically doing restoration can be a bit limiting. And so it is nice for people to be able to contribute in, in other ways if, if they have the means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you worked with schools at all? Like to just educate and spread the word and get kids uh, involved and get and educate teachers on how to educate kids about the spread of land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we at at Pope and Hale in Snape we do invite people in to do programming. So we like teach them about the historical, cultural context of doing the work. And then we actually do the work and then you know, we have all day to kind of teach each other about whatever we know. And so that's like a concerted effort of like educating the public and groups and stuff. Um, and we we were inviting kind of middle school, high school kids in, but the work in Snape Cliff has become so tiny and small because uh, we can't just throw them out of Blackberry Patch anymore. It's like a lot smaller. And so they were kind of like trampoline. We're like, oh, I don't know. It's like we love teaching kids, but they're a little bit too reckless. <laughs> and so we've really been focusing our efforts on on teaching teachers to teach the kids. Um, so like hosting pro D days for teachers this year. And it is good that they're learning, they're coming to us and learning beside us and meeting us where we're at. But also there's so many opportunities on school grounds where these restoration sites can be happening. And so hopefully they'll learn from us and then take what they've learned to start restoring the lands of their like school grounds. Yeah, so mostly focusing on adults because I wouldn't consider myself a teacher at all. Like, I don't know, I'm the youngest of five. And so I've always been like the baby. And so me being in like that leadership role is kind of not natural for me. So yeah, I, I like working with adults more, but kids are cute and everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks, everyone.